Now, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for um, closing the conference. Um, I'm not going to go through Audrey's whole biography again. Paul did that yesterday. Um, but suffice to say, we're really honoured to have Audrey here. She's come a long way, and it's a real pleasure um, to have her here and meet her in person. Um, as you said, you know, it's great being able to communicate on the web, but sometimes it's really good to meet in person. Um, I mean, I personally have been a huge admirer of Audrey's writing for a long time. Um, primarily, really, just because she tells it like it is, really. And there's not a lot of people do that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Audrey. Now, can you find your room? Great. Well, thank you. I'm very honored, actually, to be invited here to speak to you today. Um, I recognize, especially when I travel outside the US, um, sort of what a sad shape um, education technology is in in my country. And it's always nice to be at an event, um, an education technology event, that I don't actually leave from thinking, what the fuck am I doing in education technology? So thank you. I actually leave here sort of feeling like it's not all doom and gloom, but as I tend to um, probably go into the doom and gloom mode a little bit to talk to you um, today. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine sent me this exasperated email after he'd been at a, uh, a technology event just outside of Silicon Valley in the, in the Bay Area. Um, it was one full of powerful people in the tech industry, right? engineers, investors, entrepreneurs, several prominent CEOs of prominent ed tech startups had been invited to speak about the state of education, past, present, and future. Their talks, my friend reported, tended to condemn education's utter failure to ever adopt or integrate computing technologies. The personal computing revolution had passed schools by entirely they argued. And it wasn't until the last decade that schools had even started to think about the existence of the internet. The first online class insisted one co-founder of a company I won't name but has raised tens of millions of dollars in venture capital since then, and I'm sure you all know it, know it and some of you probably work with it, um, was 2001, apparently, at MIT. And in fairness, I get it. These folks are not historians, right? They're computer scientists, they're artificial intelligence specialists, they're software engineers, they're entrepreneurs. But I think their lack of knowledge about the history of education and about the history of education technology really matters. And it matters, I think, because it's supporting a prevailing narrative about innovation, where innovation comes from. In, in this narrative, it comes from private industry. It doesn't come from public institutions. It comes from Silicon Valley. It doesn't come from anywhere else in the world. And it also is a narrative about when innovation comes. There's this myopic fixation on the future. The lack of knowledge about history matters, I think, because it also reinforces this sort of powerful strain in American ideology and in the ideology specifically of the technology industry that the past is irrelevant that the past is sort of this monolithic block of brokenness that's unchanged and unchanging, right, until it's disrupted magically by technological innovation or by the promise of technological innovation or by the future itself. This ideology shapes the story that many of these ed tech entrepreneurs tell about education and their role, of course, in transforming it. One of my favorite examples of this um, is uh, Sal Khan from Khan Academy's uh, video, The History of Education. He made it with Forbes writer Michael Knorr back in 2012. And I would have to say that this is definitely a hate watch. It's hard to, yeah. Um, it's the history of education from 1680 <laughs> to 2050, told in about 11 minutes. So needless to say, it's sort of a very abbreviated history. And it's not called the history of education in the United States, because we tend to sort of pretend like whatever happened in the US is really all that ever mattered. Um, 
We don't actually mention in this history any other country except, of course, for the Prussians. <laughs> it's really weird. Americans, I mean, you know, Americans have, it's, those interested in education reform and education technology have this weird fixation with the Prussians. Um, our current model of education, says Sal Khan, originated at the turn of the 19th century, quote, age-based cohorts that move through a, quote, assembly line. That's that lovely diagram at the bottom, apparently, with information being delivered at every point. This is the Prussian model, says the Forbes writer, and it's about as inflexible as the Prussians can be. <laughs> but Kahn notes there were benefits to this, right? This was the first time that we said we wanted everyone to get an education for free. And then Horace Mann came along in 1840, and really this is how the video goes. And then the Horace Mann came along in 1840, introduces the concept of free education to everyone in the United States. By 1870, public education is pretty common, but Sal Khan says it wasn't uniform. There were different standards, different curriculum. So in 1892, something that tends to get lost in history, the Committee of Ten, which sounds pretty Orwellian, quips the Ford writer, um, meets to determine what 12 years of compulsory public education should look like. It was forward-looking 120 years ago, says Noor, but what's interesting is that we've been stuck there for 120 years. Education has been pretty static to the present day, says Salcon. And then from 1892, we skip ahead 100 years, as one does, right, straight to the invention of the internet. The mid-late 90s, says Khan as he plots it on his wonderful timeline. The big thing here, says Noor, the Forbes writer, as they skip over, I'm sure nothing happened, right? Um, as they skip over 100 years of history, is what you've done with Khan Academy. One person, one computer, now we can reach millions. It's revolutionized lectures, it's revolutionized homework, class time is liberated, adds Khan. It's changed everything. Khan Academy, founded in 2006, has changed everything. Everything that has been static and stagnant since the 19th century. So see, this isn't really a matter of forgetting history. The history of technology or the history of education or the history of ed tech, it's not simply ignoring it. It's actually rewriting history. Right? It's, and what you can think about as either activist or accidental. To contend, as my friend overheard at that tech event, or as Khan suggests in this image, the schools have not been involved in the development or the deployment of computers or the internet, for example, I mean, is laughably incorrect. It's an inaccurate, incomplete history of computing technology. It's not simply an inaccurate history of ed tech. Take the Iliac one. This is the first von Neumann architecture um, computer owned by an American university, built in 1952 at the University of Illinois. The US likes to think it's first, but I actually think that University of Manchester beat them significantly. <laughs> we will, someone should add that to the Wikipedia page, probably. Um, or take Plato, which was, again, the US likes to say, the first computer-based education system, built at the University of Illinois um, on their Iliac machine in 1960. Or take the work of this fine fellow, Mark Andreessen, now a powerful venture capitalist, almost not quite a billionaire, has several major investments in education technology, who took the work he'd done on the Mosaic web browser when he was a student at the University of Illinois, and used that to start his own company, Mosaic Communications Company, which eventually became Netscape Communications Company, launching the Netscape web browser and successfully IPOing in 1995. But I guess we've forgotten that something happened at a school with technology. The history of education technology is long, the history of education technology is rich, and it certainly predates Netscape or the von Neumann architecture. The history of education technology is deeply entwined with the history of computing and vice versa. And I could probably stop right there with my keynote because that's sort of the crux of my message, right? That there is this really fascinating, really important history of education technology that's largely forgotten, that's largely hidden, and it's overlooked for a number of reasons, some of which are sort of wrapped up in the ideologies that I've already alluded to. 
And this means as we move forward to build the, to build the, uh, to build the digital institution, the theme of this conference, right, we should probably know a little bit about the history of universities and colleges and technological innovation, and we should build from there. Despite all the problems that universities have, right, and my God, we know they have a lot of problems, they have been the sites of technological innovation, right? They are the sites of technological innovation, or they can be, in pockets to be sure, right? In spurts, yes. Certain developments in certain times and certain places, certain disciplines making certain breakthroughs, certain disciplines always getting the credit for their breakthroughs. This is sort of the little the humanities person in me sort of railing against whatever. It's my own baggage. Um, you know, certain universities get the credit for innovating, even when, dare I say, what they're doing isn't actually that new at all. And it's not really surprising, perhaps, that the ed tech entrepreneur in my opening anecdote would credit MIT, right, with offering the first online class. MIT is one of those universities that consistently gets the credit for being an innovator. And perhaps he was thinking of MIT OpenCourseWare, which launched in 2002 as an effort to put the university's course materials online in a free and openly licensed format. Side note number one, it is really interesting that putting course materials online might be confused in this particular person's mind with creating an online course. I think it probably speaks volumes about his startup. Side note number two, he, this particular person did actually attend MIT. I can like sort of figure out who I'm talking about. It's not that hard. Side note number three, actually Saul Khan also attended MIT. And I think that there's something about the MIT academic culture that is really significant here because at MIT, really the culture is that you, you take advantage of the materials, you work with your peers, you don't necessarily need to go to class. As long as you can pass the assessments at the end of, at the, end of the class, that's what matters. You know, it's unlikely when touting who put the first class online that this particular ed tech founder from my opening keynote was thinking of Fathom, the Columbia University-led university online learning initiative founded roughly around the date he, he ascribed to the first online course. And it's unlikely he was thinking of, about All Learn, the Stanford, Yale, and Oxford University-led online initiative of roughly the same period. And it could be. Because much like the movie Fight Club, the first rule of the history of online education seems to be we don't talk about Fathom and we don't talk about All Learn. And this particular ed tech startup founder definitely wasn't thinking about UK e university because, as with the development of technology, nothing happened outside of the US, right? We've forgotten all of that. Um, then those wonderful days, right, of, of the late 90s, the early 2000s, the internet, as Sal Khan notes excitedly. But we don't even talk much about that period these days. We don't talk much about the heady days of the dot-com bubble. And you know, I have to wonder how much we've forgotten. It could be that we're reluctant to talk about the dot-com bubble because some of us don't want to admit that we might be in the midst of another one. Startups ed tech startups and otherwise, sort of overhyped, overfunded, with little to show in terms of profit, and in the case of education, little to show in terms of learning outcomes. What's implied, I think, by our silence about the dot-com era, too, is that we know better now than we did then, or at least maybe the tech is better, or at least maybe we're not spending as much money on startups as we were then, or Maybe now we actually care about learning, or maybe we care more about learners or something. And some of us don't want to talk about the tech and the ed tech failures of the dot-com era too, the failures of Fathom and All Learn and UK, UK University because of the shame of failure, right? It's not just Silicon Valley entrepreneurs that are sort of reluctant to confront this. I think industry and institutions, particularly Ivy League institutions in the US have really buried those failures, which is a pity because I think there's a lot to learn 
from that moment in time. And I realize that many of you here probably know some of these stories, but I'm going to repeat them anyways. Fathom opened in 2000, closed in 2003. All Learn opened in 2001, closed in 2006. OK, UKEU opened in 2003, closed in 2004. Fathom, $30 million invested into the initiative by Columbia University. All Learn, $12 million invested from various schools and foundations. UKEU, $62 million. $62 million? <laughs> $62 million pounds. Spent, yeah, spent by the British government. By comparison, edX launched in 2012 with an initial $60 million investment in, from Harvard and, yes, of course, MIT. Coursera launched in 2012 with a total venture capital investment of $85 million. Udacity launched in 2012 with a total disclosed venture capital investment of $20 million. So again, this notion that somehow it's getting easier and cheaper to launch a startup in the 2000 teens, that thanks to open source technologies and the cloud and OER and the like, that we don't need to funnel so much money into these projects. Yeah, I don't know about that. Little way back machine magic. This is what the Fathom website looked like circa 2001. This is what All Learn looked like. Here's what Coursera's website looks like today. edX, Udacity, <laughs> FutureLearn. Thankfully, you got rid of the pink thing, <laughs> mostly. And this is what happens if you Google UK e University. You end up at Ukulele <laughs> University. So despite what 62 million pounds of investment, you couldn't even bother to keep the friggin' domain alive. <laughs> it's awesome. And you can see, I think, some things have changed, right? You can sort of see improvement in web design. But really, honestly, what's changed in the decade or so between the dot-com era online courses and today's versions? What's changed in terms of institutional involvement? What's changed in terms of branding? What's changed in terms of the course content? And what's interesting for me, what's changed in terms of the ed tech under the hood? What hasn't changed? What's stayed the same? The course content for Fathom and All Learn was pretty similar to actually what we see offered online today. Not really a surprise. I mean, this is sort of the makeup of your typical co college course catalog. Right? There's a broad swath of classes from science and business and the humanities professional development, law, journalism. 2,000 co courses were offered via Fathom, 110 on All Learn, 500 courses on Coursera, 20, 25 on UK e University. Good job, team. Um, really, the technology hasn't changed that much in the intervening decade, and sort of sadly, the phrase content delivery system is still used to describe online education. The dot-com era courses, courses offered, quote, primary source documents, animation, interactive graphics, audio slideshows, and streaming videos. Today's online courses look almost the same. Despite their boasts about better assessment tools, this is the promise of robot automated essay graders and the like. Really, it's multiple choice quizzes, which are technology from like the earliest 20th century, is primarily the way in which most assessments work in these classes. The marketing pitch to students hasn't changed much. Online courses from the best, world's best universities, that's the tagline from edX. The world's best courses, that's what Coursera promises. Enjoy free online courses from leading UK and international universities. That's FutureLearn's promise. The world's most trusted source of knowledge, that was Fathom. The focus then and now, I think, is on the prestige of the institutions involved. And they are, in a lot of cases, the same institutions. Stanford, Yale, Columbia. All Learn, short for the Alliance for Lifelong Learning, stressed 
that its classes were just that, right? an opportunity for continuing education and for lifelong learning. Udacity stresses something a little bit different today. It's about advancing your career. It's about dream jobs. There's been plenty of hype, I think, about these new online platforms displacing or replacing face-to-face -face education. I think, it's, again, it's part of this powerful political narrative that universities do not adequately prepare students with 21st century skills that employers increasingly will demand. But by most accounts, those who sign up for these classes still fall into that lifelong learner category. The majority in a lot of these cases of, the, of the students do already have a college degree. And the question remains unresolved a decade later as to whether or not people will actually pay for these online courses or whether they'll pay for the certification to an extent that these initiatives can really become financially sustainable, let alone profitable. And that's even accounting, I think, for the massive increase since the early 2000s in the cost of higher education, particularly in the US, and now looks like we're exporting that elsewhere. Um, from a 2002 New York Times article about the uni university's efforts to move online, lessons learned at dot-com U, quote, college campuses and dot-coms have looked at the numbers and anticipated a rising tide of enrollment based on baby boomers and their children, as both traditional students and those seeking continuation, continuing education. In short, the colleges have assumed that if they build it, the students will come. 2002. This is Daphne Kohler, the co-founder of Coursera, last year, saying, when she raised 43, another $43 million for her company, we hope it's enough money to get us to profitability, but we really haven't focused yet on when that might be. She echoes the sort of field of dreams reference, which I realize now is sort of a baseball reference, which is a, perhaps a bad reference to make in, in the UK, but maybe it's not the worst analogy you've heard so far this conference. Um, um, she says, you know, again, if we build it, they will come, right? She's admitted that her investors have actually told her that as long as you're doing the right thing, the good thing in education, that profits will follow. Maybe they will. Maybe they will. We can already see the pressures in, for Coursera in particular to find a path to profitability. It's raised, again, $85 million in venture capital not from a university endowment, not from public funds, not from foundation funding. And the venture capitalists do like a return on their investment. In recent months, Coursera has shifted its executive team quite a bit. It actually added a venture capitalist from the investment firm Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers as president, and it added a former Yale president as CEO. Co-founder Andrew Ng has stepped away from day-to-day -day work at the company, although he does remain chairman of the board. The new CEO of Coursera, interestingly, Richard Levin, was at the helm of, Ye Ye of Yale in the All Learn period. He was actually the chair of All Learn as well. And you could assume, I suppose, that he must have some significant wisdom that he gleaned from the university's dot-com era experimentation with ed tech. He is an economist by training, so you, he must know something, right, about the history of education, the history of technology, the history of the business of ed tech, right? I mean, you'd, you'd think. But in an interview with the New York Times this spring, he offered this explanation as to why All Learn did not succeed. Quote, it was too early. Bandwidth wasn't adequate to support video. We did gain a lot of experience of how to create courses, and then we used it in 2007 to create very high quality videos, now supported by adequate bandwidth in many parts of the world. With the Open Yale courses, we've released 40 of them, and they have gained a wide audience. All Learn failed, he argued, because of bandwidth. The internet bandwidth in most homes was inadequate for the sharing of course material, he contends, which is sort of weird, since All Learn actually made its materials available on CD-ROM as well. And like many sites in that period would actually let you toggle on and off high bandwidth content. I mean, the site recognized that streaming video might be a challenge, so it allowed people to actually download and watch content offline. 
And remember, All In was also marketed as lifelong learning. It, the pitch was made specifically to the alumni of these elite universities, as well as to the general public. The alumni would pay about $200 per course. The general public would pay about $250. The most expensive All Learn class was a creative writing class, which was $800. So I guess Levin wants us to believe that these groups of people, you know, Yale alumni, were unable to access the site because they had bandwidth issues. I mean, they somehow assumed that they would pay between $200 and $800 for a class, but they wouldn't pay for internet. Yeah. And this is something that my colleague Mike Caulfield has questioned. He's, he writes, All Learn folded in 2006 when broadband was at a meager 20% adoption. Today it's different, supposedly. It's at 28%. Are we really supposed to believe that in that 8% of the population is the difference between success and failure? Caulfield always also asks what Levin learned actually from his experience with Open Yale, the ed tech venture that followed All Learn. By Caulfield's calculations, these courses were created using $4 million of Hewlett Foundation money. The videos are recordings of class lectures, $4 million for 40 filmed courses, or if you prefer, about $100,000 for a course of video lectures. Now, $100,000. Sound, might sound pretty similar. That's the number that's often bandied about is what some universities are spending to create a Coursera class. So it is interesting that in this discrepancy between the costs and the revenue, there is this inability so far to find a sustainable model that, and that plagued the dot-com era ed tech ventures. From a 2003 article in the Columbia student newspaper, Fathom spent money at an unsustainable rate. In 2001, Fathom burned through almost $15 million and generated revenues of only $700,000. And this is what plagues Coursera today. This is in part, I think, why history matters. Well, <laughs> history and a little bit of humility, probably. It's not easy to reflect on our failures, right? It's not easy to reflect on the failures of the dot-com era or to move forward, I think we have to. We have to in order to make progress. I think it's important to recognize as well, however, what are the successes of the dot-com era. And remember that despite the failures of sort of these high-profile initiatives like Fathom and All Learn, these ones that came from prestigious universities, that there were other online efforts at the same period that didn't fold. There were ones that went on to become sustainable and that are continued today. But I would argue as well that sadly, one of the uh, most significant successes of the dot-com era, financial successes, is one that's left really an indelible mark on education technology, and that is the success of the learning management system, the technology and the industry. Learning management systems do predate the internet, of course, but it was the internet that became the big selling point for these. From the Washington Post in 1999, quote, Blackboard chalks up a breakthrough. Its educational software lets colleges put classes on the internet. That was several years I'd like to point out just to sort of rub it in before the story in my opening anecdote about MIT. But who's keeping track of who was first, right? The LMS, or I guess the, the VLE, as I should probably refer to it here, has profoundly shaped how schools interact with the internet. The VLE is a piece of administrative software. The word management, in the case of learning management, the learning management system is right there to remind us. It sort of gives it away. The software that sort of purports to address questions around teaching and learning, but really we find oftentimes sort of circumscribes some of those possibilities. You can see the dot-com era roots in the VLE's functionality and in its interface. I mean, some of them still look like the same software that we were using in 2000. It acts as an internet portal, right, to the student information system. And much like those old portals of the dot-com era, it sort of warns you whenever you want to venture outside onto the web. Much like AOL, if you want to sort of venture outside the AOL portal, you get the warning messages that say, are you sure you want to learn on the World Wide Web? So you want to stay inside the lovely 
information system here. You can access the VLE through the web browser, but it's not really of the web. It's a silo. It's a technological silo by design. Right? And this isn't because the technology isn't available for us to do something different. Rather, I think it's a reflection of the institution of education. This silo works because I think we do still tend to see each classroom as a closed entity because we view each subject in each discipline as a closed, distinct, atomistic entity, closed, centralized, control in the hands of administrators, control in the hands of IT, control in the hands of the teacher, but rarely, I think, in the hands of learners. And if you look at the most hyped online courses today, those ones offered on Coursera or edX, you see the influence of the VLE. You can see that each course is sort of siloed and separated in that same sort of way. At the end of the term, you lose access to your material. There's a tab in the LMS and a tab in the MOOCs that lets you see the syllabus and a tab for assignments and a tab for that wonderful invention that we still think is so wonderful. <laughs> the discussion forum, right? The message board, it's 2014, and we're still acting as though the message board is this greatest breakthrough in adding a social component to, to our courses, thanks to the learning management system. But it doesn't have to look this way, right? It doesn't have to be this way. There are definitely other stories that we could tell about education technology's past, and there are certainly other paths forward. Again, there's this hidden history of ed tech and of computing tech, and I think it's worth considering why we've dismissed it, why we've ignored it. The work of Ted Nelson, for example, the work of Douglas Engelbart. The person that I always like to refer to is Seymour Papert. Computers, argued Papert, should unlock children's powerful ideas. That's the subtitle of his 1980 book, Mindstorm, a book that I really do insist that most education technology, all education technology entrepreneurs read before they talk to me. And I admit that you know, his book does actually focus on children rather than adult learners. But the book addresses, quote, how computers can be carriers of powerful ideas and the seeds of cultural change, how they can help people form new relationships with knowledge that cut across the traditional lines separating the humanities from the science and the knowledge of the self from both of these. It's about using computers to challenge current beliefs about who can understand what and at what age. It's about using computers to question standard assumptions about developmental psychology and, in this, and the psychology of aptitudes and attitudes. It's about whether personal computers and the cultures in which they are used will continue to be the creatures of engineers alone, or whether that we can construct intellectual environments in which people who think of themselves as humanists will feel part of, not alienated from, the process of constructing a computational culture. Computers, Papert insists, will help children gain, quote, a sense of mastery over the peace of most modern and powerful technology and establish an intimate contact with some of the deepest ideas from science, from mathematics, and from the art of intellectual model building. 1980. But as we see with the learning management system, ed tech has come to mean something else entirely. As Papert notes in his 1993 book, The Children's Machine, progressive teachers knew very well how to use the computer to their own ends as an instrument of change. School knew very well how to nip this subversion in the bud. Computer-aided inspiration, that's what Papert argued we should build, instead of what's been, instead we've seen computer-aided instruction. And we come full circle again, back to what something I mentioned in passing at the beginning of this talk, Plato. Programmed logic for automatic teaching operations, the computer system developed at the University of Illinois in 1960s on its Iliac machine. Early versions of the Plato, and this is actually a later, this is actually a later version than early 1970s, had a student terminal attached to a mainframe. The software offered mostly drill and kill tutorial lessons. As the system developed, more and more sophisticated software was written. 
more problem-based lessons. A new programming language called Tutor was created so that anyone could create their own modules. The mainframe supported multiple networked computers so that students could communicate with each other as well as to the instructor. And this was pre-groundbreaking stuff in a pre-internet, pre-web world. The network system made Plato contribution to the sort of this network system um, made it the site for the development of a number of pretty interesting and groundbreaking innovations in computing technology, not to mention ed tech. It is thanks to Plato that we have forums, message boards, chat rooms, instant messaging, screen sharing, multiplayer games, and emoticons. Plato was, as author Brian Deere argues in his book, The Friendly Orange Glow, Plato was the dawn of cyber culture. But as with so much ed tech history, Plato's contribution to this has sort of been forgotten, mostly forgotten. We can still see the remnants of Plato in many of the features of ed tech today, including, of course, one of the earliest learning management systems. And if the learning management system has sort of trapped us on one hand in a dot com era when we think about how schools interact with the web, it also, I think, still carries forward this legacy of thinking about how we interact with the mainframe. And there are other legacies as well from Plato. One of the features that Plato boasted was that it would allow you to track every keystroke a student made. You could monitor the, and get the data on every answer a student submitted, right or wrong. That sounds pretty familiar. Plato offered efficient computer-based testing. Also sounds very familiar. It offered the broadcast of computer-based lessons to multiple locations where students could work at their own pace. Again, pretty familiar. Indeed, by the mid-1970s, Plato was serving students in over 150 locations, not just on the University of Illinois campus, but in elementary schools, high schools, and on military bases. And again, sensing a huge business opportunity, right? This notion of tapping into the giant education market, the Control Data Corporation, which was the company that helped build the University of Illinois mainframe, decided that they were going to go to market with Plato, spinning it out from a university project to a corporate one. They charged $50 an hour to access the mainframe, for starters. Each student unit costs $1,900. Um, the mainframe itself, $2.5 million. Uh, the, the company charged $300,000 to develop a piece of courseware. So I guess it is getting cheaper to make courseware these days. Needless to say, Plato as a commercialized computer-aided instruction, instruction system was largely a failure because who the hell has $2.5 million for a mainframe and $300,000? Oh, I mean, other than Harvard and MIT, of course. Um, the main success that the CDC had was selling it as an online testing system to the National Association of Securities Dealers, the regulatory group that tests people to licenses them as stockbrokers. I love these little sort of cycles of ed tech, right? And like the learning management system, this idea, however, of computer-assisted instruction has become this, has sort of retained its sort of powerful hold over ed tech. I think the history of Plato would show us that the history of the learning management system and computer aided instruction are intertwined computer based instruction, computer based management. And I think as we move forward again to build a digital institution, I think we have to retrace and even unwind some of these connections. Why are we still building learning management systems? Why are we building computer-assisted instructional technology? Our current computing technologies demand neither, right? Open practices don't demand this. Rather, there's a certain institutional culture, a certain set of business interests, no doubt, that like this. What alternatives can we build on? What can we imagine, perhaps a future of learner agency, a future of human capacity, one of equity, one of civic, uh, uh, civic responsibility, one of openness that doesn't look like these previous, previous versions of education technology. And I called this talk 
unfathomable, of course, because I wanted to thumb my nose at Columbia University and the failure of Fathom, and gesture perhaps to what we'll probably see in the next few years, which is some sort of failure of Coursera. I call this talk unfathomable as well because I think there's so much in ed tech that we've failed to explore. Partly because we've failed to learn about and respond to and reflect on the history of ed tech. I think it's easy to blame technologists. I've made a career out of that. But I think that it runs much deeper than that. I think that there's a failure of imagination to do something bold and different Something that, to borrow Seymour Papert's phrasing, would unlock powerful ideas in learners, rather than simply reinscribing these powerful institutional practices, these institutional traditional mandates. And I think we can't move forward until we've reconciled some of these places that we've been before. Thank you. <laughs>